before there was Lamar Jackson, before there was Randall Cunningham, before there was Michael Vick, and before there was Cam Newton, there was Jim Zorn. In 1976, quarterback Jim Zorn burst onto the NFL scene for the Seattle Seahawks and completely lit the city of Seattle on fire. Zorn may have been the very first true dual threat quarterback in NFL history. More than just a scrambler, the Seahawks had designed run plays and QB draws, and in fact, blitz checks where he could check to a QB draw to take total advantage of his unique running skills. And as a passer, he combined with Hall of Fame receiver Steve Largent to become one of the most dynamic passing combos in NFL history. When Jim retired, he slid right into coaching where he became one of the most effective and innovative quarterback coaches in the NFL. I recently had a chance to sit down with Jim and talk about insights into playing the position for the Seattle Seahawks and to get his philosophy and takes on coaching quarterbacks. This is the full interview with Seattle Seahawks quarterback legend, Jim Zorn. When you came into the league, uh, I don't think the NFL had seen anybody like you. And you've been compared, or they compared you at the time, to Fran Tarkenton. And Fran would scramble around and buy time in the pocket, but you were a different guy. I mean, they had designed quarterback draws for you to run. Uh, you were the first dual threat quarterback in the NFL. Thoughts? Well, I was, uh, yeah, I could run up the field. That, that really is a good observation. And it was different than what had been happening in the NFL at that time. Uh, I was uh, always given the freedom if I saw a coverage where uh, it would be a two deep safety with a man underneath and, and there were only four rushers, nobody had me. So I right. could audible to a quarterback draw. And so there were games when we knew a team was going to play this particular coverage, and we called it two-man. Most, most uh, hosts on uh, television call it two-man. Right. And, and I could audible. So I would audible, my, and I would just follow my center and then break off of him wherever, whichever direction that he, uh, he was headed. So, yeah, I, I ran up the field. We did have uh, – we had a, a series called the Sprint Draw Series that allowed me to get outside and run up the field as well if I needed to. I always thought it was crazy that teams played you in man-to-man -man because there are clips of uh, your, your wide out to the right running a post, your slot receiver to the right, or your tight end to the right running a crossing route, and it wiped out the entire side of that coverage, and then you're just jogging down the sideline into the end zone. Uh, why, why would people play man against you guys? Well, uh, it's harder, actually, in, in uh, most schemes, it's really harder for a quarterback to uh, throw on, on the kind of rhythm he wants to versus man coverage. You have to be really, you have to be right on time. Uh, the DB is closer to the receiver, so you have to be accurate in your pass. And, uh, you know, it just makes it... Uh, uh, much easier for a defensive front to pass rush, get pressure on the QB, and then the QB not have that that rhythm or that timing to right. throw uh, the one on one the one on one pass. Basically, uh, it makes it more difficult for the QB to play man coverage. But most defense uh, around the league, if you if you do not have a solid underneath cover group meaning uh you're a, a corner that can cover one-on-one -on -one, a, a a nickel back or an extra db or a linebacker that can't cover a back or a tight end uh you have you have to play more zone which which plays into the hands of uh quarterbacks uh, right I, I think right so uh, when you when you broke in with the seahawks did the coaching staff when they saw what your style of play was and what you could do on the field? Did they try to um, squash what you did out there? Say, stay in the pocket, you know, or did they just say, you know, 
run, run the scheme, but do your thing. Because there's a lot of coaches that are really afraid for their quarterbacks to get out there and run around. You know, do they just? Yeah, I, I get a good question. So uh, for me, uh, that was part of my asset, right? That was part of my skill level. I could throw to the left on the run. I could throw to the right on the run. And um, so, so we... So we took advantage of that with that sprint draw series. And uh, I was allowed to run up the field. But Jerry Rome, who uh, he, Howard Mudd, and Andy McDonald, who put this whole uh, scheme together, what, what they did, what actually Jerry often would say, you know, be smart. Uh, it's better to, uh, you know, we need you the next play, right? So right, right. that was one of the uh, war cries of Jerry is make sure you get down, make sure you run out of bounds. And as a coach, I would do the same thing to my quarterbacks who could scramble. And, you know, you, you had to have a strong desire, if you will, to play the next play. Right. So back in the 70s, <laughs> when football was a heck of a lot different and you're running the ball and you're sliding or getting down to protect yourself and you're playing like the Oakland Raiders and their secondaries coming in on top of you, throwing forearms into the back of your helmet, a little bit different environment to, than today. Yeah. And I, I was quick enough to avoid a lot of the shots that were about to be delivered because I would, I, I learned how to uh, hit glancing blows. Like I could go straight onto a guy and then just at the last second I could, I could veer and not have that straight on uh, kind of blow up shot. I, I could hit with shoulder pads or I could glance uh, with my helmet. And um, it made it, you know, it, it made it so that I didn't get, I really never got knocked out in a game. It's amazing to me how many quarterbacks don't have that mindset. I mean, they're running straight up and down and they're allowing guys to take clean shots at them. It's just, that's crazy to me. Yeah, it's hard to, uh, well, it's just, you know, it's, you know, some of these guys don't get up the field uh, as often. And um, I, I just think, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's, it is awareness, Yeah. but um, you have to have that, uh, uh, like I say, that strong desire to uh, get, get yourself down so you can get in and play the next play with uh i still have a haunting i still have a hunt in me almost the very first game we played uh in the kingdom uh regular season or maybe it was preseason uh we played the san francisco 49ers no it was it was a preseason game and uh we were down to the fourth quarter had i scored we would want we would win the game and i went down and i got hit on the two yard line on a scramble of going, trying to get into the end zone. And I, that play still haunts me. I think I should have launched myself, <laughs> sacrificed myself in some way to uh, get, get into the end zone. And I still remember that play. And that was one of the very first games in the kingdom that we had ever, you know, that, that was so, it was so, so close. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I think we, you know, as the, uh, the we were early in the game, I would love to play today's game, but not because of that. I I think that uh, the strategies are still there in, in bigger ways because defenses are much more complex. I right. know more about the game than I <laughs> I did when I played, and so uh, yeah, I would love to play in today's game. But I wasn't. Uh, I'm not. I'm not disappointed in the my my time in the game. We played. We played some. Uh, Com, you know, really competitive uh, seasons. And, you know, I wish we would have gone to the Super Bowl early, but I didn't know anything about expansion teams and de de the development of a team, the draft, how the draft is formed and all that kind of stuff until I was uh, almost out of the league. Yeah. So that leads you to my next question. I, I was a high school senior when you were a rookie and I'm sure that you were the same way as I was that we played the game with our, our ability that we developed on our own and had the ability to throw the ball accurately and play the position. 
What's your thoughts on the quarterback environment today with these high school kids, uh, private QB trainers, these camps, which uh, are really well done. And these guys are getting coached so that when they go into college now, they're so much more advanced than we were. Well, there, there's, there's certainly a skill level that happens. You know, there's a lot of seven on sevens that don't necessarily um, uh, help the QB because you know, you're, you're, picking out you're picking out receivers you just have to have better athletes and i think the athlete the athleticism of these young guys they know they're good their parents know they're really good and they get uh, they give their kids an opportunity to uh, run around and dominate uh, in these seven on sevens or maybe in these camps i think that parents uh, sometimes uh, are fearful that they're not allowing their son to, you know, to uh, make it, if you will. Right. And uh, I think um, there's also there's also a, a group of of players who go to schools who don't give an opportunity. You know, if you only throw the ball uh, four or five times a game, but you you you're a better you're a good passer, uh, but your coach says this is the this is the offense that I know, and this is what we're going to run, uh, mm -hmm. you're stuck a little bit unless you go somewhere else. Uh, mm -hmm. So the development is, is a little bit all over the place. And that in college, uh, it, it could happen the same way where you get, uh, you get into a program at the college, you get a scholarship, but the coach uh, can't really help improve you, if you will. Mm -hmm. And there's some that it doesn't matter what level it is, but you get these, uh, you go to a school, you get a scholarship, but it's not a, you know, it's not one of the big, the big conferences. And you learn all kinds, you learn, you really learn football because that coach is going somewhere. Right. He has studied, he may not have the name yet or recognition, but he can teach you or teach that QB what he needs to know to play it at, at a much higher level. And then that young man dominates and he becomes ready. There's, there's no uh, exact formula. I think um, the, the, the QBs that are coming out need to have a, uh, when you were in high school, you just had, you, you definitely wanted to have a sound release, but uh, I think there's a lot, there are a lot of gaps in, football 101 right that you know it, it takes uh it takes time uh because a lot of qbs if you will and even parents they would not think they would think hey i just want you to throw with my son but classroom uh and and learning defense uh that's that's part of the game as well and just learning about football in general uh, right a lot of gaps that that kids have that need to, you need to fill those gaps. And some of them do in college and some of them never will. Well, I'm sure that you, you went into college the same way I did not knowing how to read coverage. Uh, I was never taught that in high school, we just threw to the open guy, which is usually the first guy in your progression. Um, and so, yeah, the development now and the guys that get the, these young quarterbacks in the classroom and teach them how to read coverages pre and post snap, these guys are so much further ahead of the game. So that's, that's a good thing. When you played in the seventies, how much, if any control did you have on game balls? Were you, did they have those things under lock and key? Was there any way that uh, those things oh. were adjusted slightly for you to throw it better? Oh no. You know what? Uh, in today's game, every ball is doctored because there's a, there's the same mud that is used uh, on baseballs, right? right? Right. Every ball is mudded. Uh, every football is mudded as well and cleaned up, uh, brushed off. Uh, I know that now the, uh, there's much more scrutiny because of the in, uh, deflate gate right. uh, problem that, uh, what happened a few years ago, but that, that wasn't really a, that's not a huge that's not a huge uh, detriment for the quarterback or anything like that. It's just that uh, everybody wants to have equal 
equal uh, football opportunity to throw. I mean, we didn't have uh, separate footballs when I played, you know, where the, we just had a bunch of balls and the home team <laughs> supplied the balls. Right. And now every team has their own ball. Every team has a ball that is stamped by Mr. Official. So right. that knows that he observed it. He had his little, his little air monitor and right. uh, measuring tape. And so everything is equal. But um, the, the big problem that we had with footballs when I played was there were, we did not have a mud, if you will. And so the ball had to be rubbed out a little bit and get this uh, protective wax right. off of the ball. Uh, to make it easier to throw, to not make it slick. The wax on there uh, was designed to keep the ball from getting any uh, water damage on it right. before you brought it out of the package. And so we would rub it, uh, we would uh, have, I'd rub it in the grass, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, all four panels just to get that uh, initial wax off. I liked a newer ball. Uh, when I played because uh, the leather had not stretched out. So it didn't, it didn't get big and round. It stayed, it stayed a little more compact. And uh, so I, I always liked brand new footballs as long as they were uh, uh, shoved into the ground a little bit before you had to play with them. And, so, and, the, and the, the laces were the, you know, the laces uh, I would check the balls out because I liked, I didn't want f really flat laces. I liked not huge laces, but I like bigger laces. And every once in a while, a panel on that ball would uh, be sewn, uh, sewn incorrectly or just a little off, or the panel would have a little bit thicker leather right. than the other panels, and it would wobble. And so I would spin the balls to make sure that they were they, they spun when you threw them because the spiral had to stay there. Anyway, uh, too much technical. No, no, that's, that's, pr that's but, beautiful. Uh, today, uh, quarterbacks, they get to, uh, they get to approve their balls. They get put in a bag and, but then Mr. Official has to approve them and they get to play with their own football uh, during the game. Now I know that you used to spin the ball on your index finger and I, pick that up from you and uh still worthless do it. a thousand worthless tricks good yeah well what's your thought on quarterbacks doing that kind of stuff with footballs i mean i always told my guys the more stuff you can do like that it's going to help your game out well i don't know if it helps game but it does help you get to know the ball and to right. you know, to be comfortable with what it does it's kind of a it's it's a weird you know it's a weird shape uh but yeah, if you know how it bounces, um, you know how it spins. R really, I started doing all that stuff just because, you know, you have to, you you have to stand around a little bit in different, in different times during, right. uh, you know, before practice. I'm warmed up, but uh, you know, I'm just fiddling around with the ball. And if there was somebody else there, I wouldn't fiddle. I I'd, I'd be fiddling with that. You know, I'd be throwing it back and forth and, right. uh, you know, yeah. So there's a lot of ways I, maybe, it, I don't know if it improves your game or not, but, uh, you know, it's not bad telling people that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a better QB because of it. No, right. I, there, I always say, uh, you know, I have a 101 worthless tricks I can do with a football and, uh, I know there's not that many. Yeah. Right. Hey, did you uh, ever jerry rig any of your equipment, like your shoulder pads or anything, to give you better flexibility and throwing? Uh, I took a uh, I took a foam pad out of my throwing arm uh, because I felt I had more freedom. Mm -hmm. I had our equipment manager add a panel in my arm because I didn't. You know, we had sleeves with stripes on them, and they came down to here. Uh, and today's game. You know, the, the sleeves are, they have a little elastic uh, around them and they're up real tight. So your right. arm has freedom. But I, I, so we had to keep the stripes. So I had the equipment guy put a, a bigger panel in my, you know, maybe a three inch strip in my uh, sleeve so I could, so it could be loose. Um, I didn't do much else. I had a, uh, 
I, you know, I, I, we wore, uh, we had a towel and now you have to wear an official towel that is approved by the NFL. But I just wore a, a washcloth basically in front of my, uh, in front of my, uh, uh, belt and guys used to ask me to borrow my towel. And so I, I give them my towel and then they go, <laughs> you know, and then they, yeah. and then they give it back to me and I, here I have to, you know, uh, keep my hands dry. So instead of having all that slobber on my face towel, I always had a, I started getting a second towel, a second <laughs> wash. I, I called it my guest towel. And so when a guy would ask for, you know, for my towel, I, I said, sure. <laughs> But I'd give it my guest towel, and then I'd shove that back into my britches. That's so, good thinking. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's, I think it's, you know, it's, you have to learn those things as you go along. Right. <laughs> it, it, there are a lot of snot bubbles out there. Yes. Okay, so uh, favorite stadium to play in in oh, the NFL? God. Well, the Kingdom, for sure, because you could guarantee the weather. And guarantee the, the you know the turf. The turf was hard, but uh, it was fast. It was a really fast track. Uh, I think as stadiums were refurbished and redesigned, uh, there's there's great stadiums around. I always liked to play uh, uh, in Carolina because they had uh, you know the weather was great there, and they just had this great uh, regular grass field that uh you know was a full field it wasn't a baseball field or anything right. like that uh so i like to play in a lot of games the worst ones were uh either frozen ones in the winter or ones that there was a baseball field and it was baseball season you know through october and so you're playing half part of the game on gr regular grass which was great but you're also playing on cinder cinder right. uh, baseball fields and that made it really difficult because you know as you're as you're scrambling or running it, it you know you're you're on different surfaces and that's that's a bit of a distraction what was the worst field you played on uh at at that time again i think it was the probably the raiders and san diego uh LA when we played in Anaheim because they all had baseball, baseball fields. Baseball, yeah. Looked up to it. I think those two surfaces were hard. It was great if you're on the grass, but you you knew you were coming to the cinder, uh, the you know the infield, if you will, uh, on some of these fields. Th that was tough to play on. So throwing the ball, what was your worst weather condition that you didn't like that affected you oh, throwing? Probably that affects every QB is high winds. Those are you know rain. Not a big deal because you get to exchange the ball a lot. Um, snow, pretty fun. Game slows down, except right. you know you can throw through the snow. Uh, but so high winds uh, because you had to change trajectories. You had to make sure you spun the ball. You had to control the ball. And based on uh, if you were throwing left or right, that affected it based on the wind and w which direction you were going. Uh, you know, uh, on the field uh, during quarters. So you had to have a good decision to where, did you want the wind in the fourth quarter? Do you want to throw against the wind? Do you want to, is the wind coming left and right? You know, there's a lot of things to, to decide as a QB. So this may sound like a silly question, but when you're playing in a wind uh, environment, when you're warming up before the game, did you make it a, a, a conscious effort to throw both directions? with the wind and against the wind. Yes. Yeah. It made a conscious effort, but to control the ball for a lefty, I wanted, I wanted to throw with the wind coming right to, to my left because it kept the nose of my ball straight. If I, if I was throwing and I was left-handed and the ball and the wind was coming from left to right, my ball would tail the ball naturally because it's spinning like this in the wind it actually, every ball catches it. And the right-handers, it would be just the opposite. Right. So, uh, yeah, so I would, you know, figure that out early in my in my career. 
And if you're throwing in that, you know, sometime, some part of the game, you're throwing in the very worst way you possibly could throw, where the wind is coming left to right, your ball's going uh, down the field, and so your ball uh, is going to get get blown to the right, and it's going to it's going to turn and tail this way. So how do you figure those things out? Uh, I <laughs> right. think um, number one, you you got to throw hard, and you change your trajectory a little bit, and the ball is uh, maybe not as affected. If you get the ball up in the air, right. uh, can't control it, and you don't figure the the uh, wind a little bit, yeah, it'll affect it. Uh, much like a golfer or a kicker uh, kicking in a stadium with a, a lot of wind. And uh, the guy who taught me one really important uh, concept was, uh, it was Steve Largent, who was mm-hmm. one of my uh, key wide receivers in the Hall of Fame. Yep. But Steve used to say, listen, it's my job, it's our job as receivers to catch the ball. So uh, Z-Man, I do not care if the ball comes end over end. I'm going to catch it. Right. So if it's wobbly, if it's not a tight spiral, no big deal. Just get me the ball and get, make it catchable. And so, uh, you know, sometimes in high winds, QBs, uh, you and I, we don't have the chance to throw a ball with this really tight spiral coming in with the nose of the ball right there. You know, it's going to be like it's coming in sideways sometimes. Right. Right. And so uh, the receiver still has to catch it. So it's our job to make those little adjustments, but we still are responsible for the completion. I want to talk about Steve Largen for just a second. Um, <clears throat> I know you guys are buddies. Uh, we're tight, and that's that's a big part of a quarterback-receiver combination. But Talk to me about your unspoken, the unspoken language that you had between each other and how that played out on the field. Yeah, I think we both had the same, <coughs> excuse me, we had the same uh, outlook on, on the game uh, from the very, from day one. Uh, he wanted to be, uh, he wanted to be very, really good. I wanted to be really good. And so our communication had to be uh, as as best as it could be. And so he would work uh, after practice or before practice. We would work on uh, issues that uh, were possibly going to come up. And I'll give you an example. Uh, if we had a uh, if we had a team that changed coverages a lot, uh, and we were going to run a comeback. Uh, a, a deep out uh, during that game at some point, or that was going to be a key, a key throw. Uh, after maybe after practice, we would work on the different types of technique a DB would play in this in a game, and what Steve was thinking. We would talk about what what he was thinking based on the leverage of that defender. For example, if the if the defender was off and hard inside, he would he would run his comeback. He would just take him straight up the field, try to get him to run vertically, and then right. and then come out of it. And he was really good because he had a low center of gravity. He could he could be out of breaks really quick. Right. But if the if the DB was pressed on him, and we still had the comeback on, we knew or I knew that he was probably if he got hung up. <laughs> And all I could do was just peek because I was trying to keep uh, the other defender inside a safety inside so I could isolate him one-on-one outside or not get a flat defender to move outside. So my eyes weren't totally on him, but I would peek. Right. You know, it would be almost pre-snap that, if okay, so he's got press man. He's going to come out of it maybe two yards shorter if he's going to – if he gets bumped or he gets – if he gets grabbed or whatever, it's it might be two yards shorter, and but I had to be right on target because the DB was that much closer, and so I had to anticipate that. So the ball was already in the air when he was going to make his break, uh, and we could, you know, you could say, hey, now the guy's soft and outside, or he's pressed and he's bailing out. There's just different ways, and we would express and practice all the different 
uh, types of breaks. So when I'd look out during a game, I was very comfortable. It didn't matter what how the DB was playing because I knew how Steve was going to come out of that break. And we did that on many different types of concepts and and patterns. Um, he was a he he per, he was a perfectionist, right? Yeah, right. And uh, there's a reason he's in the NFL Hall of Fame, and that was just a small uh, portion of why uh, he he was as good as he was. You know, uh, Lester Hayes was really uh, a great corner with the Raiders, and Lester gave uh, uh, he was a guy that uh, loved to play press tight man coverage, right. and but based on your your the pattern called uh steve you know uh, there would be adjustments there would be adjustments versus zone versus man versus press versus off and so uh it's the responsibility of the receiver to know uh where he is uh and what route he's running but it's also the responsibility of the qb to know this exact same thing right and yet the QB has to know what the guy on, on the other side is going to be doing, that slot guy is going to be doing, the tight end, the back. And there's a lot of or – there's more to just that one guy sitting out, out there. But after the ball snapped and after I've, uh, you know, uh, adjusted either protection or changed the play or kept the play on, I would know uh, what Steve was going to do based on – how that d defender uh, was on. Now, I wasn't necessarily just looking for him because some games, uh, defense, <coughs> defensive <coughs> coordinators would take try to take Steve out of the game and he wouldn't catch as many. And then, you know, the next game he'd catch 12 balls. So right. it was just, uh, and he never complained, but he would always, uh, I think Steve always had the right adjustment and I always tried to get, uh, you know, when when the right when it was right to throw away, man, I I, I just pound, tried to pound him with the ball. And of course, Jerry Rome, who was our offense, you know, play caller, quarterback coach, receiver coach, he tried to get Steve the ball too because he Smart. knew what he could do with it. Right. Let's talk uh, coverages. Uh, did you, what was your pre-snap uh, checklist for determining coverage? Well, it was uh, yeah, indicators, right? Uh, and the better teams would disguise coverage. So you did, you walked up to the line of scrimmage and uh, there were always things that I try to train QBs to do even today. And that is, as you walk up to the line of scrimmage, don't wait, uh, especially early in the game. Get up and get your snap count started. Uh, the gun has made it harder because... Um, you know, uh, QBs are not necessary. The, the better QBs, the better offenses, you have to see what the front guys are, are aligned because now you either have a back or you have a five-man protection, don't have a back. You have a possibility of bringing in a tight end to block. You have a, a back to block or you can bring him in to block. And so you have to know, number one, how you're going to be protected. That's number one. Then number two, trusting those guys that they're going to pick them up. So uh, before, even before the snap, you've got to try to get uh, an idea of coverage. And the better, the better defenses always give you the same exact look pre-snap. And then at the snap, they go into their coverage. Right. And so Gary Rome taught me uh, that, and I, I've used this as a coach, is that don't wait. Don't go up to the line of scrimmage and stand there. And I always hear the announcers, oh, he's looking over the <laughs> yeah. looking over the field. He can really <laughs> he's trying, you know, and if you can go fast and not allow a defense to wait, they'll get into their coverage scheme much quicker. All right. So uh, there's a lot of things going on as the QB is getting up the line of scrimmage. Now, um, when you think about this idea, and you said it earlier, pre-snap, post-snap. Mm -hmm. So before the snap, there's a lot going on. But then uh, you you always can believe the picture at the snap of the ball. So you always have to you always have to be um, aware of what's going on at the snap. And a lot of times it'll be the safeties that tell you kind of where coverage is is going. 
uh, linebackers will as well. But um, for example, uh, if you had two safeties inside and they rotate and one goes deep middle and the other guy comes up wherever he comes up, is when the guy goes deep middle, you know that both the corners are going to go b- deep outside. Uh, if the safeties go deep outside, you know the corners are going to come. You don't even have to look outside. So it's really a fallacy that the quarterback has to read the whole the whole field. You're just looking at rotation. Um, you can predict man coverage based on the intensity of – it's not everybody because – uh, I remember Ed Reed, great safety in, right. for Baltimore in this league. And Ed, he could disguise coverage really well. He could act like he was playing man and playing zone. He could right. act like he was playing zone and he would be playing man. Uh, I think um, Troy Palomalu, uh, they gave him freedom. He'd line up in, the, in one of the gaps between the center and the guard, pre-snap, acting like <laughs> he was going to blitz. And sometimes he'd jump over and, yeah. and he would. And then sometimes he'd be playing his he'd be playing uh, cover two or deep outside safety. So at the snap, man, he would haul to get deep outside. And uh, so he could be disruptive. Those things are disruptive to the QB. But uh, as I said earlier, uh, it, it, you got to get up to the line of scrimmage or get in that gun and get the ball snapped so you can – force that defense to show you sooner than later what what they're trying to do. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Now, what you just said, Jim, is what I wished every TV analyst, former quarterback would be saying to the viewers during a game. Yeah. Explain how how stuff works. Yeah. You see how long it took me to to explain. In in TV, you you can say it, uh, but – uh, the, and that I watch a lot of games without sound yeah. uh, because, you know, I hear the announcers going, oh, yeah, he really read that cover two well. And it wasn't cover two. He might have, uh, you know, the safety on that side went deep outside, but he was playing a deep third because the other safety went deep middle and that corner had in one on one. You know, it's not cover two. Uh, oh, you know, they <laughs> blitzed him. Well, they, no, they didn't blitz him. There was a three-man line, and one of the linebackers came. It was just a four-man rush. Right. So sometimes coaches or past players can get upset because of how announcers see it. But they, uh, I, I, I feel for an announcer because they've got to, you know, you got to talk in sound bites, and you got to yeah. see it very quickly. We can't have a discussion because right. the next play's coming. Right. Okay, let's change gears and let's talk about the Seahawks' uh, fakes, field goal fakes. Uh, legendary, always fun to watch you guys play. Yep. And every time you lined up for a field goal, everybody's going, uh, are they going to kick it? Or are they going to do something really cool and goofy? Um, did you have any say-so in any of those designs, or was that all Rusty Tillman? Well, think about it. I was uh, – that. okay, so I'll answer this question. So um, – I was a starting quarterback, mm-hmm. but I didn't want anybody else to hold. I loved holding. And uh, because I was a threat, you know, we, we had the opportunity to uh, run more fake field goals. And uh, Rusty uh, was our special teams coach, Rusty Tillman. But Jack Patera, uh, he was the true designer behind fake field goals. Didn't know that. I took pride in that, that, that team. Um, you got to really treat it like, uh, like it's an offensive play, like it's the offense going out and running a, a play. And so um, we didn't spend a lot of, we couldn't spend a lot of time on the fake, but Jack would spend hours and hours going over video watching what an opponent would do on a field goal try. And if you came from one side and overload, you tried to come up the middle or you tried to play whatever coverage, he would just get them all. He would study them. And then we would create a fake field goal. And I would tell you this, every single game I played for Jack Patera, we had a fake field goal in. And it was different 
every single game. So he took pride in preparing it. And I think I uh, helped by, number one, making them successful. And we, you know, the thing that he explained, we had to do some different things. We had to take risks that teams won't take today uh, because we were not as physical. uh, uh, We couldn't hold up physically. So we had to create other opportunities and first downs. And we did that with fake field goals. Uh, But it was Jack Patera that he had to call it. And he had confidence in calling it. And we, we, you're right. Some of them were just wild. And uh, I think I loved that risk, if you will, yeah. as a player. Uh, you know, Keith, sometimes uh, I'd line up and I would hear the whole defense saying, it's a fake. Watch the fake. And right. it was. And we'd fake it and, and still, still get the first down. <laughs> right. or cut, you know. Yeah, that's a statement right there. Yeah. How much of a kick did you guys get out of uh, Efren Herrera? Oh, he, he was, he, <laughs> my nickname for him was the Matador because he just was very, he was dramatic and, you know, uh, he was really uh, an accurate kicker. Uh, I, I loved, uh, you know, he could, he, he was a good talker and uh, he, I, I'm always uh, angry with him that he didn't score on one fake field goal, that he had a chance. I threw him a pass and he should have run it in but he was he kind of he kind of waddles when he runs so he <laughs> right. real, but he yeah he uh did a lot with fake field goals whether coming through faking like he was going to kick it and then me pulling the ball and uh getting up running throwing uh or pitching whatever or he fake fake like he'd kick and run through and you know our first one was Efren catching a pass uh against the Atlanta Falcons right, right. and uh that was a huge play. And Howard Cosell, who was uh, one of the major announcers of the Monday night football game, right. that's when uh, everything kind of lit up for for us as a team because we had never played on Monday night and we started doing all these uh, fakes and things like that. And uh, we, we got a reputation to do that. Efren was a big part of that. Um, in high school, you were a multi-sport guy. And speed skating, you had you were a speed skater? Yeah, that's that's I, unique. I, so I drove Zamboni machines. Uh, <laughs> and the guy that owned the sk- ice skating rink that I worked at was Frank Zamboni. He actually owned wow uh, an ice skating rink in Paramount, California. And I worked as a guard there. And they we didn't have hockey. It was a little bit bigger ice uh, slab of ice, but we had a speed skating team called Demora, and. Uh, I just, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to skate fast. And so it was pretty fun. So we did indoor, uh, like, uh, short track skating, uh, indoor. And I was not in the fastest group though. I was, uh, uh, there were senior A's and those were the senior A men. Those are the speed demons. Those were the guys that would go you know, we're working out, traveling all around, going to the Olympics or these nationals. I was in the senior B men and I, uh, I pretty much stayed around California, uh, with our group, but I, I won and, uh, you know, I won some championships and stuff as a senior B man. And I was, uh, I worked all the way through college and I, so I speed skated in college. I think that helped me become a better football player, uh, because, it helped me with my with my feet. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were other sports I I did as well uh, during high school and actually college. I played four four different sports. There's a fifth out there, but four sports for sure in college. I, I speed skated. Obviously, I played intercollegiate badminton. I was on the badminton team, and uh, <laughs> that really helped my feet. And that's a yeah. violent. That's really a great game. Then I threw the javelin. <laughs> in yeah. track my senior year uh, because we didn't have a javelin thrower. So the track coach asked me to throw it and he taught me how to do it. And I threw the javelin. Then I played football, but I surfed as well in Southern California. Uh, and I could, I could throw the heck out of a Frisbee. So, I mean, I, I could, I was super talented. How about uh, hacky sack? Were you a hacky sacker? Uh, I was not. I, I, <laughs> yeah, that's been later. Okay. Uh, that, that sort of uh, was somebody else's, trick. I, I, I 
could try to work at it and see if I could get good, but uh, <laughs> okay. I haven't developed that skill yet. All right. Um, let's talk about what happens on a football team when you've got two really good quarterbacks. So Dave Craig and yourself, uh, because I went through a similar situation in college, what was the dynamic between you two and how important was that dynamic to the success of your, of the team? Well, when Dave, Dave and I were both free agents and, uh, Dave actually was on the football team because, uh, draft choice, Steve Meyer got injured and it was a career ending injury. Uh, Dave made the team. He backed me up for a, a while and, uh, you know, I helped him as much as I could. And um, the, I, I think it was a hard dynamic uh, after a while because, you know, teams, teams or the, the league at that particular time had quarterbacks that were uh, going to the Super Bowl that stayed in the pocket. Mm -hmm. And I was, a, I was a scrambler. I could stay in the pocket, but part of my game was moving around. Well, I was being encouraged uh, to, to stand there and throw the ball. And uh, that, that was, uh, you know, it took part of, part of my game away because right. the emphasis was, was right there. So uh, there was pressure outside of competing for the position. I mean, I was a starting quarterback. So uh, at, at one point in uh, early in the mid eighties, if you will, uh, Dave became the starter. And I had always professed to people that I was a Christian athlete, that I was following Christ in my lifestyle and my play. And, you know, uh, I had, I had said that out in public. I had said that in private. And so now here I am, I get my position taken away from me. Right. So here's the dynamics I wanted to do. I wanted to um, be as negative to the coach for making that decision. And I wanted to disrupt Dave uh, for taking my position, you know, blaming it on him. And so uh, I went home that night and I had, you know, I was trying to devise plans, if you will, right. to disrupt. And my wife went, huh. So, uh, so all that, all that stuff that you've been talking about, uh, is uh, irrelevant now because you got your position taken away from you. So uh, I went to work that next day and I said, okay, I'm done with all the, the plans. I got to help. I, you know, that's part of my job. So that's what I did is I supported Dave as much as I possibly could. I still got to play at points where. Uh, either Dave was uh, got an injury, or uh, we weren't doing really well, or um, or it, you know I I I still tried to stay competitive, but um, I had an injury that slowed me down, and uh, uh, there were all you know all kinds of circumstances, and uh, I tried to just be as good a teammate as I possibly could be, and right. that was my that was my war cry. So when you have two QBs that can play at your school, you got to choose one. I would say this, that uh, for, for coaches, if the position is truly open and you can, you haven't decided, you truly haven't decided. Great. You, you explain that if the, if you've got two QBs and you don't want to hurt one, the one guy's feelings, but you have a sense that this guy is going to start, that needs to be expressed because uh, the, the guy that, you know, you're really impacting the guy who thinks the position is open, but it's really not. And you're not getting, you know, if, if a guy, if a guy is really better than this guy or in just in your impression, it's going to work itself. It's going to work itself out. Who do you think, who, in your opinion, who was the best quarterback in the league when you played? Oh, gosh. Well, Dan Fouts was uh, throwing 400 yard games. He was uh, really good. Um, I felt like I, I was good, but there were guys that um, that had, you know were far more experienced than I was at that particular time. Roger Staubach was an excellent QB, 
And uh, for the Dallas Cowboys, he did a lot because he could move around right. and he was very, uh, he was tenacious competitor, taught me a lot because I had uh, my very first year before the Seahawks even, I was with the Dallas Cowboys for a stint. Uh, he was good. Um, so, yeah, I would say Dan Fouts was one of the better QBs in the National Football League. There were guys that, uh, you know, uh, could throw super accurately. He was one of them and stood in the pocket. His team protected him, and he had some good receivers, and they, yeah. uh, they kind of lit it up. Yeah. Uh, as a QB coach, what was the one thing your quarterback did that drove you nuts? Well, um, the, the, the one war cry, uh, uh, you have to have a little discipline to play the game. So there's two things that would drive me, probably drive me crazy. One is that a QB would uh, not play with the talent that he had. He was trying to be somebody different, right? Hey, I saw this, so I'm going to try to do this. But you don't have the talent to do that. Don't do it. You have the talent to do these things. And each QB is different, right? So uh, that would really bother me if that, if that thing came up. But probably the one thing that can hurt, uh, with it, now I'm thinking of all kinds of things, but one thing is to have a quarterback uh, be in duress and have these throws, I would call them flick throws, just, just a, a reaction and you risk too much instead of scrambling or instead of protecting the ball, you, you, you think, Hey, I've got to throw it. So you throw it up, but you didn't have a plan on how to let it go. And the ball floats. That's, that's really difficult. Um, or, and this is probably the, this is probably bigger even than that is that a quarterback that doesn't study and can't be trusted on the field uh, because the play caller has to be able to trust that that QB is going to read the play the same, the same, the same way every single time, right? Hey, right. I called this play, uh, and this is you know he already knows how, how it's either A to B to C, but I don't want him to read it C to B to A. Do you see what I mean? Well, yeah. uh, why not read it C first? Because oh my gosh, he was going to be wide open. Well, that's not the play because you've got to read it or you read, you know, Hey, I want you to throw opposite rotation. He throws into rotation. I want you to go, you know, left, just like we started with left or right man. I want you to work this side zone. I want you to work this, whatever it is, not to, not to do that, not to be trusted to do that. And a lot of it is just uh, the lack of study that the QB has to put in to get it right. And, the, the lack of feel uh, for, uh, during the game. You have to, I, I think uh, there's a lot of QBs, Russell Wilson being one of them, he does a great job of executing each play as they come. We got this play, I'm going to execute it. He's not thinking about, he might be thinking about the situation, but he's not going to be thinking about uh, the other, you know, a play that he had called that wasn't successful or a play that, hasn't been called yet that he wished the QB coach would have called or the coordinator called. He's going to execute the play call. And uh, I, I think that, I think Matt Hasselbeck was like that. Uh, I think the better QBs can stay with execution of the play called, you know, you, you, as a, as a QB uh, you're living in the present, you learn from the past, but you're living in the present. And when the future becomes present man you're you're ready to you're ready to take that on too because you're, you're prepared you're, you've studied you you've uh, you've been in the game you know what you know what you're expecting yeah hey listen um this has been a real thrill for me jim to do this and talk ball with you um this is great for seattle seahawk fans but really valuable for coaches out there college and high school gold some of the stuff that you've gone over i really appreciate it and uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this. Anytime your uh, coaches need to clarify what I'm talking about, uh, because it's very difficult to answer a question and to not example it or see the examples of what, of what I'm talking about, you could misunderstand it and be wasting time. And my goal uh, for QBs and QB coaches is not to waste 
not to waste time, but the time you put in has got to be exact and valuable and helpful to play the game. Because it doesn't matter about looking good. It does matter about playing the game on the field. That's what that's what I'm getting these guys ready for. Yeah. Beautiful. Right. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate right. it.